Hello, hello, and welcome back to CS492G, Foundation and Future of Virtual Reality, Artificial Intelligence, and Massively Multi-User Online Role-Playing Games. We are approaching the end of part two about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the theory, the foundation, um, VC dimension, shattering, pack learning, and approximation properties of neural networks as one common prevalent model of uh, um, machine learning. And uh, last time um, we heard Binyam uh, give the first part of the uh, uh, two parts of presentation about approximation capabilities of neural networks, emphasizing um, uh, providing them some mathematical foundation such as how to measure quality of approximation in terms of uh, metrics. And uh, he gave examples of various metrics and how uh, neural networks give rise to functions. And today we're going to continue and build on that. <clears throat> uh, things will become um, very mathematical um, again. And this is a presentation given by Pasawat. So Pasawat, you have the microphone, you have the screen sharing. Uh, please um, take them away. Thank you, Professor. Let me first share my screen. I think I will share my entire screen because um, I will change tabs later. So I will continue with part two of the topic of approximation capabilities of neural network. And this is going to be quite a long presentation because there's a lot of topics in here, but I'll try to do it on time. So the first question you might have is approximation, what? So what do you approximate right here? So what do we approximate is we want to know, we want to approximate what the neural network systems are actually capable of. So we can approximate that with the universal approximation theorem, which is the main theorem that we are going to be discussing in this presentation. And spoilers, the artificial neural networks can do pretty much everything, kind of. Let's see. First of all, we need to recap on the artificial neural network to go into it mathematically. And for, ba uh, for basics, we have in an artificial neural network, we will have the circles, we'll call it nodes or neurons. And they are divided into layers. And each layers are connected to each other with what we call connection or synapses, just like real brains. And the first layer will be the input layer. And the layer before will influence, will determine the number in the next layers. And there will be the intermediate layers, we call them hidden layers, and the final layer will be an output layer. So that would be like the output of the program basically. And the number of layers we will call depth and the number and the max number of mm, max number of neurons in a given layer will we will call it width, just as you just as you see here. Now let's zoom into one layer of neurons. So each neuron will have a value. We will call the value on the left X and we will call value on the right Y. And here the connection will have bias. We'll go, I'll go through it very quickly because I'm sure you have heard it before. And then um, each neuron will have its own bias and each connection will have its own weights. And we'll have an actuation function sigma, which 
um, first of all, we will do some linear algebra, uh, time, time the, no, the value on the node with the weight and sum them and sum with the bias and put it through the actuation function. This will be the value for the next node. And we can do some linear algebra to make it vector like this, y1, y2, y3, and, we'll, and we will have it in terms of matrix multiplication like this. So all of this, we can simplify it to y equal to sigma of wx plus b, which is a lot more simpler than whatever this is. So in this simple form, x is the input vector and y is the output vector, w and b are internal parameters, which um, we only choose the initial value and the learning algorithm will find the correct one to use for the correct functions. And sigma is mostly non-polynomial to allow linear model to be done. And sigma is chosen by us, the programmer, and some of the population some of the popular activation functions include uh, the sigmoid function, the geometric ten function, and the this one is called the ReLU function, which is the max between zero and x. Now let's go into the universal approximation theorem. So the overview, like state it in human language first, you can say that any continuous function can be approximated with an artificial neural network. Or we can also say that an artificial neural network with the right size and the right parameters can approximate any continuous function. So what does it mean by approximation? To approximate means we have a group of function that can be arbitrarily close to a function you're trying to approximate. For example, we have this group of function, like there are infinitely many functions in here, like starting from coarse to finer, 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 but it will never actually touch the blue function, which is the function we're trying to approximate, by the way. So, up. So we said that arbitrarily close. So it means that we want uh, we want accuracy to be as high as possible. Like the accuracy can be as high as possible. But so we measure accuracy by using the error function, the epsilon, which if epsilon is equal to 0 0.5, the function are allowed to reside within these areas. If it's go out of this area, it says that it's not accurate enough for epsilon 0 0.5. So if we have, so arbitrarily close means epsilon can be as low as possible, but not touching zero. And we can still find a function in there that approximate this. For example, epsilon equal to 0 0.5, this one can fit in here. Epsilon equal to 0 0.1, I'm pretty sure this one can fit in there. And if approx epsilon equal to 0 0.0001, there's going to be function in there that can fit that. But never it never touched the real function. This is what we call by approximation. But we need to define them mathematically, right? So let's say we have for all epsilon because in a previous function, we can choose epsilon, any epsilon that's more than zero. So let's say we have any epsilon, we can choose a function g, which is in which is in this set, which is a set of all continuous function from r to n to r to m. For all epsilon, we can choose a function g that this work. Will this enough? Will this be enough mathematical proof? Will this be enough mathematical mathematical notation? 
Let's see. So it matters on the position of x. If we allow this to, if we allow um, x to be chosen first, it might not be what we want. For example, let's see this function, right? Um, if we choose for all x, so if we choose x first, if we choose x equal to 1 right here, there exists a function g that this value x is lower than the epsilon line, right? And if we choose x equal to, let's say, 1 over 4 here, well, there's also a value, this or there's also a function g that this value x is lower than the zero, than the epsilon line. So no matter what x we choose, we can also, we can always find the function g that, and that particular x will be lower than the epsilon line. But that's not what we want. We want all the x to be lower than the epsilon line at the same time, not like one by one like this. So we have to say that point-wise convergence is not what we want here. What we want is for x to be inside like this. Now, we use what we call what we call a uniform convergence. It means that they will, for every epsilon, we choose epsilon first, and then there will exist a function g that the function g have the desired accuracy for every possible input. So we choose epsilon and then we choose g first, and then we it is this function g is true for every x. Well, we run into another problem because the domain is to infinity, right? Let's see a function like this. This is a parabola function, but but what we want is we want this one to be able to approximate this blue function right here because it's what Taylor series essentially does is Taylor series approximate different kinds of functions that have that is re really different from polynomials with polynomials, right? So we want to do something like Taylor series, but in this case, if we do this, it's not true for all x because if we, no matter which function we choose, no matter how small we choose the function, if we zoom in way to the right, there's going to be a point where the function, where the point where like the red graph comes out of the epsilon line, like always, because it's the polynomial function and this is the constant function. So we need to confine the space of the approximation. So we need to do approximation in a compact set. So for example, uh, we can say that for all epsilon more than zero, we can find the function g that there exists x for all x in zero to three, it's accurate. So right here, we can find this to zero to three. So we can find a function that's accurate enough for from zero to three. And note that if a set A is compact, we means that the set A is both bounded, uh, bounded and closed. Okay, now let's move on to the official, like the formal definition of approximation. So what we want to do is replace this one with a compact with any compact set K and replace the norm with replace the absolute value with a norm because we might use this on like an R to the N space. So we can't use absolute value to R to the two or R to the three. So we use norm instead. And then we say that it's true for all compact set K. 
which is a subset of R to the N. And this is the meaning of approximation in the mathematical sense. So if a set G, which is a subset of the function from R to the N to R to the M approximate function F, we means this one. And well, yeah, we I have a note right here because uh, a to the b is a set of all functions from a to b. And this one is, we are still using the Euclidean norm. So, the, which is the L2 norm, which Binyam told us earlier on Tuesday. Or in other words, we can say that we can simplify this one, this whole expression right here into uh, this one. We say this one means that the maximum value of this one for x is for x inside k is less than epsilon. We can say this one too for conciseness. And now let's I will put this one, I'll put that equation right here so you guys can remember it. And I'll show you an example on a real function, a real valued function. This is like a quite a famous theorem called a Weierstrass approximation theorem. It says that a polynomial set can approximate all continuous function from R to R. So we denote Rx as the set of all polynomials and CAB is the set of all continuous function from A to B. So what does that mean? It means that, well, it might look so messy, but it's just, we have for every function in, for every continuous function, there exists a compact set K right here which for all epsilon more than zero, there is a polynomial G that the error is less than epsilon. So let's kind of like make this more easier to read. So for every continuous F, we want the set K to be compact. So a compact set in real number is just A and B. And for every accuracy epsilon that we need, there's a polynomial G that this is true for all X in this interval. And let's visualize this classic theorem with Maclaurin series on E to the X. So we said that we want to approximate E to the X in the interval minus one to one which is a compact set. So we recall that a Maclaurin series, right now we are trying to use polynomial. So we are not trying, we are not using the infinite sum. We are just using the finite sum to the n, which is still a polynomial, right? So by Taylor's theorem, by the error term of the Taylor's theorem, we can deduce that is less than this one. Like, um, you don't have to understand how it came here, but the error, like the Maclaurin series can approximate this one really well, such that the error term is really low if n is high. As you can see here, if n is one, the error term is quite large. If n is two, it's better, the error term is better. And if n is three, it's almost touched. So, we want to show that we can approximate this one. So what do we do? We we already have a compact set right here. Next, we choose an epsilon. And we have to choose a polynomial that can that can approximate the function e to the x. So we pick n such that this one is n plus one factorial is larger than this one. And so we get 
g is equal to this one, which is p, which is the nth third, which is the nth Maxwellian series. So we'll get that for all, for all accuracy, epsilon, we can always find a polynomial g that this one is true in the compact set minus one to one. So this is one of the example on how we can approximate uh, any real function with pol just polynomials. And next we'll try to approximate any r to the n to r to the m function with Let's start. So in our, the universal approximation theorem has two case, like two states meant together. One is arbitrary width and one is arbitrary depth. So right now we arbitrary width means we fix the depth. Like right now we only have three layers, like three layers is enough, but the number of nodes right here, we can choose any number of nodes. So if we want to, so of course, if you want the approximation to be better, we should choose more number of nodes, right? So then the approximation, the universal approximation theorem says that for any uh, integer n to m, which is going to be the dimension, like the number of input nodes and number of output nodes, so for any number of inputs and output, and we let the sigma be non-polynomial function, this one's important because if this one's not polynomial, we can't actually do any function. Let's say, let A be a set of artificial neural network from R to the N to R to the M with one hidden layer that uses sigma. The uh, universal approximation theorem states that the set this set A of artificial neural networks approximate F for every continuous function from R to the N to R to the M. So it's quite impressive with only three layers, right? Now let's make let's use this fun this let's use this uh definition of approximation to actually see what the actual mathematical statement is about. So we have the same compact set and for all epsilon more than zero. So we have to choose, so the original one, we have to choose G, right? But right now we know that G is an artificial neural network in this form because we have the weight a so we have to times the input with a and we plus add add with the bias bias b put it through the actuation function sigma and then times with c right here so the actual statement states that there will exist a size and then there will exist there exists a a matrix a a bias b so it means that for every epsilon we can find a size a bias wait a bias a weight and a weight that makes the neural network a pretty good one to approximate it in the epsilon within the epsilon accuracy. So after after the statement, I actually would like to do a visual proof, but after I go and research about the proof, I think that it's a bit, no, not a bit, 
very, very complicated. And I think that if I were to present the actual mathematical proof, it would take like, I don't know, another two hours or something, given that I actually understand it, which is not the case. So I will try to opt it out to, into an, a visual proof, which might be more beneficial because a mathematical proof, um, many of you might not be able to get anything from that. So let's change into, are you guys seeing this website, right? Okay. So this is, um, this is actually a website that, but it has like um, an interactive element to it. So let's, let's first start with, in this case, that guy used with use uh, a sigmoid function as an actuation curve. So we have like an interactive element here. We can adjust the weight to make it more intense and adjust the bias to shift left or right. So this is just what one node do. Like it does just this with the sigmoid function as the actuation function. But and. To simplify it a bit, if you use a really high weight, like weight that that's like really high approaches infinity, you would get kind of like a step function like this. So in this case, we know that the step function, so the only one parameter of the step function right here is the point where it jumps, right? And we know that the point where it jumps is equal to minus b over w, like this. Yeah. So we can simplify this one node into just one parameter s, which is just, uh, I don't know, the, the object jump of the step function. So after we simplify this one node to a step function, like how can a step function do much, right? Well, if we do two nodes, we can see that this weight on the right side right here can actually set the intensity, like how much it affects the overall function because up here, the step function only reaches up to one, right? But in everyday function that we want to, that we want to approximate, it just reach so high. So we can just adjust the weight here to adjust it up and down like this. And this one can do so too. And a negative weight means that it will go down below like this. So we have more freedom to do what we want. Now, to simplify it even more, this is this set of weights and S values will make what we call a bump function. So like the weight will, we can adjust the height of a weight with the bump function and we can adjust like the size and the position. Like there's one bump up, one above and one bump below, which can do this kind of thing right here, where, which we can approximate any function, like kind of approximate a lot more function than we can. So if we do a lot, we can approximate like this weekly function right here. Like we can, we can set the we can set the parameters to for these things to mesh. And so we, we, I want you to keep in mind that we only need to approximate in a compact set because that's what the, that's what the approximation theorem said. We don't need to like make infinitely many amount of nodes so that we can approximate in, until infinity. This one is just enough. Now, 
let's move on to how about many input variables. If we have x and y, we can plot it like this. So if we set y to zero, x is the same thing, just sigmoid function with weight, with intensity as weight and bias as shift thing at them. And we can simplify it into what we do the same as the step function for y. And well, what we need, well, we will do the same. We'll just do the bump function with two nodes. Like in this case, we set y to zero. So we can just set x into like a bump function in the x coordinates. And in y coordinates, we can also do the same. We set the bump function in the y coordinate. And we, if we add these two together, we can make this kind of thing. So actually, what we what we want from this function is kind of like this tower function because this is like the basic building block for two by two S blocks, like we are playing Lego. So yeah, we can adjust the bias here so that it's kind of like here. You can adjust this bias right here so that it can be a tower function. And after we have a tower function, we can put many tower functions together by doing like this is one tower function and below is another tower function. We can do, we can put many blocks in one graph and then we can put many graph here. We can have a smooth function approximated. So in this case, we want, we say that it's arbitrary width, right? So we can have any width, like any number of, any number of nodes here we want. Like we can have like a thousand nodes, we can have a million nodes if we, if it makes us approximate this one better. So however, this one might be like, might be one of the, one of the most inefficient ways to do artificial neural network, but it, it sufficiently proves that it's, it can be done. And well, to go back to our proof right here, like I'm sure that the visual, like we can work from the visual proof and work a bit more to get the error function and work a bit more at the beginning to approximate the tower function for every non-plinomial sigma, but that's going to be quite a bit of work. And I would like to skip because most of you guys probably um, see the picture of why only one layer can approximate any function already. Now, let's go to the next case. It's a bit more, it's quite a bit more complicated. So I'm just not going to go that much into detail. So in arbitrary depth case, we confine the number of hidden layers to, we confine the width of the hidden layers to n plus m plus two nodes, but we allow them to have infinitely many layers. In this case, Mm. Yeah, so the statement is actually the same, but let sigma be a non polynomial function such that in this case, there's like a bit more subtleness that um, it has to be differentiable at one point, at least one point differentiable, and that point should not be zero like the difference the difference yeah the diff at that point should not be zero 
okay, this one is not equal, not more than. So the theorem goes the same way. Let A be the set of artificial neural network with any number of hidden layers and each hidden layers have n plus n plus two nodes and use sigma as the actuation function. And we see that the theorem states that for every f, for every continuous f, a approximates f. So this would be an arbitrary depth case. And well, now let's move on to approximation theorem in LP space, which Bin Yam has introduced in Tuesday. So he introduced the LP norm, right? So this vector right here, the so the P norm of the risk vector right here, normally you would use P equal to two. So it'd be squ x1 squared to the xn squared and square root, right? But right now it's x1 to the P plus x1 to the plus until x1 to the n and takes the pth root. And let this one, LP, AB, is a set of wagner levesque P integral function from A to B. Actually, I haven't learned about Levesque uh, integration bef before this. I think it's kind of similar to um, differentiable or integrable because Levis integration is similar to this integration we learn normally. But like right now, I, I'm, I'm quite not sure right now because I only had like one, le a bit less than 24 hours to research about LP. <laughs> Sorry guys. So uh, an arbitrary depth case, with LP, we can be like this. They have, like, we have a more simple right now, like back then it's N plus M plus two plus one and M. But this one, fix the actuation function to the ReLU function, which is a max of zero and x. This arbitrary depth case states that uh, it's not like the approximation in the same sense that I said before, because that one uses the Euclidean norm. Right now, it's like the LP space norm, which is defined with integration. So like this one is the same. So for all function f that we want to approximate, we can choose an epsilon, which is the same. We can choose a fun we can choose an artificial neural network G, this is which is the same. This one should be A because I define this one as A. Oh, well, there's a typo. And this one, we change the norm a bit from the max of fx minus gx the difference is that right now we integrate the p norm over the r to the n. So we just integrate them all from r to the n. It's, it's like, you know, it's a much more harsher norm because for example, uh, let's So I will, so this is the equation that we are going to look at into it. Let's bring back the old functions. Like this is the first case where the top row is the first case that we say that it can be like, it can be approximated because uh, the difference is it 
So right now the area approaches zero. So the function back there, like next the next function that is as small as we want. It's quite it's compact in this sense because we can choose a compact set k first to confine the space. And then when once we confine the space, we can we can then choose the function g to press it down below the epsilon line. But in this case, you don't have the compact set. You have to integrate along the real number. So of course, this one is not going to be approximate. This one is not going to be able to approximate this function because the like of course the, the area is infinite in the real number, of course. So we have to integrate infinity. So we so you could say that um this LP norm is uh stronger because it it can approx like this function meet the criteria of this one but doesn't meet the criteria of this one so we can we say that the lp norm is stronger not really because the contrary is still true like in this case in this case like we bring back this one right which is actually um uh which is actually this function so in this case we can use the sense of the euclidean sense of approximation because if you set a compact set here you said for all compact set right but if you set a, comp a compact set here you can't really approximate it because it goes into infinity but if you approximate it with the integral right here you can actually integrate them because the area right here is finite even though the value goes to infinity the area is finite so we can set the so uh integral right here comes out to in this case for k and k is this value here right if it goes on in, until infinity we can choose the k that's high enough so that this whole function is less than epsilon. So in this function, you can approximate it with the LP norm, but not the normal sense. But in this case, you can approximate it with normal sense, but not the LP norm. So it's not um, so it's not that anything is stronger. It's just different sense of approximation. This is what I understand of it anyways, because as I said, I only have like one night to uh, to research all of this. Um, yes, yeah, so we reached the end of our mathematical part and let's move on to the conclusion. So to conclude, the universal approximation theorem states that an artificial neural network can approximate any continuous function. So in this sense that for every compact set, we can make, we can find an artificial neural network that's as accurate as possible. And well, you can, you can constrain either width or depth. So if you want, if you want to constrain width, you can do it. If you want to constrain depth, you can do it. And you can also approximate function in LP space, which is which works differently and can approximate different function than in normal Euclidean norm sense. And this is the the pros of the this is the benefits of the universal approximation theorem. But there's like the limitation too. So this universal approximation theorem does not provide the weights and bias for the for the artificial neural network. It just, if you ask them like, hey, can you approximate this? It will just say, I can, but like how to do it, 
It would just say, I don't know. Just figure it out yourself. I just know that I can. So, this is not like an algorithm. This is not useful if you want to find way bias to actually do your own approximation, like to actually do your own um, artificial neural work. But it's good to know that you can approximate pretty much anything. And it also does not say which which sigma activation function is good because it says that if it's not polynomial, you can use it, but it does but it doesn't say that which one makes it converge faster in practical sense, because in practical sense, you would like some function would converge really slowly and some functions would converge really quickly and you would use that function as the actuation function. But this one doesn't say which one to use. This one, I forgot to delete this, I'm sorry. And the next limitation is that the function has to be continuous. So let's illustrate, let's illustrate on that. <laughs> like the function has to be continuous. So what can we do with this limitation? So one of the thing that's continuous, one of the example that's continuous is like number recognition. So image processing, of course. So we like, it's a problem if we want to know what this number is based on like, the lightness of each pixel. Like if a pixel's dark, it's zero. If a pixel's completely bright, it's one. And like if it's dim, it's 0 0.5 or something. And we'll have 780. One, one pixel by a bit, like 0 0.1 or something, then it's still a nine. Uh, I guess I disconnected. So what I was saying is that the image recognition is this function is continuous because if we change a pixel a bit, the fun the output is still the same. That's like that's the point of being continuous in functions, right? However, a function that's not continuous is, for example, kept cryptographic hash function, which, well, if we, you plot it, you'll get something like this. It's a function from, in, from integer to integer that's not, wait, I haven't shared my screen, haven't I? Yes, I haven't. So what I was saying is that number recognition is continuous because if you change one bit, it's still a nine, but cryptographic hash function is not continuous because uh, if you change one bit, if you change the input by a bit, it just goes somewhere else entirely and very far away. So it's really not continuous at all. So the universal approximation theorem doesn't apply to this. So it will, however, however, like even though it has to be continuous, most of like the use case of the universal pro, like most of the use case of the artificial neural network is on some kind of continuous function anyway. So I think it can do pretty much anything except, I don't know, um, hacks, hack your computer because it can't do 
it can reverse crypto cryptographic hash function. And yes, that's all for today. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Right. And as usual, we're now going to take a short break of like four minutes to allow you to digest the presentation and to collect your thoughts and to compile them into comments and questions about the content, not about the quality and style, but about the content, okay? So short break of like four minutes. So, and here we are back from the break. And now it's your chance to ask some questions and to give some comments about the content of the talk, not about the quality. Oh, I wanna say that, um, unfortunately, like my, my internet keeps disconnecting. So if some of you like miss some parts, like I don't know what part is missing because I just keep talking and I don't know which part's missing. So. So if you want to hear some part again, you can tell me. Yeah, that's a, that's a aspect about the, uh, the quality and the uh, technical part. Let's postpone that uh, question for, for the second uh, part and the feedback, right? But, I mean, so, if, they, if, they do, if they have something that they want to ask about, but the information is missing about the content, you. they can ask me to repeat them so they can like, get the content. Yeah, so, so I have a question actually. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that one layer is sufficient, which is kind of surprising, right? Yes, one layer is sufficient. Yes, one layer is sufficient. But then you had another construction that uh, involves several layers, right? Yes, yeah, so it would be an arbitrary depth case. But, yeah. Right. So from, from that perspective, what is the benefit of having more layers? Taking into account that one layer, you prove that one layer suffices. Mm. I think uh, uh -huh. this is this may be a very difficult question, so don't worry if you cannot yeah. answer it. So I'll I'll try I'll try my best to answer like I'll try my I'll make an educated guess. So like if more if we have only one layers we need it seems that we need to do a lot of with like we need a lot of nodes in that layer because like just to approximate a simple function in the in the visual proof we we use like ten or twenty nodes already. So. And also, like, um, in this case, if we have only two layers, if we have no, if we have only one hidden layers, we will have like not many connections here because the input is and in, input is two, the output is three. Like, input is two, the output is one. It would be like, um, this one would be like ten connections, and this one would be like five connections. But if we do it like right like like this. We can have a con um connection matrix that's very complicated and nuanced. Like this one, they have uh twenty five connections right here just from one layer alone. So like if we have many, I guess that if we have hidden layers, it will act as a sort of like 
um, I don't know, it can com calculate more complicated aspects of the input. That's my educated guess. That seems reasonable to me. I wouldn't really know the answer myself, so fair enough. Another question is in the you had the hypothesis that the activation function is not a polynomial. Yes. So that raises the question, what happens if you have a polynomial? And also, maybe by the Weierstrass theorem, if you have polynomial, then everything is trivial or everything is wrong. So if you violate the hypothesis, then either the theorem becomes wrong or it becomes trivial. That's, um, does that make uh, sense? Yes, yes. So actually, like, uh, it is said that um, it became strong. So if the actuation function is polynomial, you can't, there's a certain function you can't approximate. We should be, um, which I would guess it would be a continuous but non-differentiable function, like or some function with really complicated patterns, like a sine wave that shrinks as it gets to zero, something like that. That's my guess. But in the theorem, in the full theorem, it states that. If it's non polynomial, if it's actually polynomial, you can, uh, you can approximate some function. Thank you. Great answers. Further questions, discussions, comments. Can you repeat the question that you have just? Ask once again. Sure. So, the universal approximation theorem, as presented by presented by Passavat, supposes that the activation function is not a polynomial, and that raises the question: What happens if the activation function is a polynomial? And Passavat has given. A very good answer to that question. Very clear. Would you like to repeat that? Yeah, sure. I will repeat that. So, uh, in the actual theorem, like in the actual full theorem that I didn't put it here, it says that if the activation function sigma is actually a polynomial function, we can we the theorem says that there will be a certain function that we can approximate. I personally have no idea what that function might be, but I guess that the function that it can approximate might be a um, kind of like a non-differentiable function, like a, a straight line, a zigzag line, or some kind of complicated function, like a sine wave that shrinks that gets to zero. Something like that. That's my guess on the function it can approximate. Thank you. Other questions? Like how does it relate to what you guys may have learned in standard classes on machine learning, right? Right, so some of you have taken classes on machine learning, right? 
and neural networks. But somehow this important question does not seem part of the standard curriculum. Or is there something, I have not taken a class on machine learning myself, so maybe there are some chapters or aspects that are related to this question, or is this completely avoided that question, or is it irrelevant a question? I wouldn't really know myself, honestly. So I would want to give an answer in my opinion. In my perspective, I've taken the CS three seventy six on machine learning, and uh, I think four one three on MAS four one three on uh, artificial intelligence mathematics. Even in mathematics department, they don't teach. I I can't remember that they teach this appro universal approximation theorem. So I this is I've already took two machine learning courses both of both times I've heard of artificial neural networks, but this is the first time I've heard of this universal approximation theorem. Okay, thank you. Last call for questions or comments about the content three two one sold <laughs> okay so again thank you congratulations well done and indeed this was very short um uh, time to prepare and you did very well uh, and thank now you. we're proceeding to the uh, feedback about quality and uh, style of presentation, and this is going to be off the record.